welcome our partners for futures um, the conversation centers around how we can create access to sustainability education in our region we have an hour together and we want to make sure we can have enough time for your questions so um, i start with introducing our panelists and if you don't mind i quickly go to the podium and advance my slides so i want to start with um, what we heard this morning, that the Regional Center of Expertise for Education for Sustainable Development really wants to center young voices, first and foremost, um, indigenous voices and voices of, from people of communities of color. And so I'm so grateful that we can have our young voices here represented by the two co-founders or founding members, I should say, for Fridays for Future Arizona. Um, so we have Lizzie Quickly. Welcome, Lizzie Quickly. You are a youth activist and an educator advocating for sustainability education, climate action, and sustainable development on both the local and the, stage, uh, the, the state uh, level. And like Mauricio, you are a founding member of Fridays for Futures in Phoenix. You hold several leadership roles with various um, themes related to climate and sustainability and involving a variety of groups. And this morning we saw featured the work you've done, Turn It Around Cards. It was um, shown on screen. You're also with the Sustainability Alliance at ASU. You're with the United Nations Association with Changemakers Central, ASU Millennium Fellows and the um, Sustainable Development Student Task Force. So I'm reading out all of these associations because it helps us understand where is part of our coalition of the willing. And Lizzie will be graduating um, in May with honors in degrees in supply chain management and sustainability. Kudos to you. And then next to Lizzie is Mauricio, who is Leon. And also Mauricio, you are a youth activist and an advocate for sustainability, climate action, and leadership development at local and global levels. As Lizzie Mauricio also is a founding member for Fridays of, for Future, advocating for climate action and climate justice in Greater Phoenix. You also hold a variety of leadership roles with other climate and sustainability groups, including the Honor Society of Sustainability, then also the Sustainability Alliance, um, campus student sustainability initiatives, the sustainability bodies, and Access ASU. Again, remember all these great organizations so that we can put them into the fold. And you are um, a second year sustainability student and working towards two certificates in energy and sustainability and international business. You have lots going on. Great to hear from you and have you. Then next to me is Molly Cashin, staying with the kind of um, sustainability education theme. You already met Molly Cashin this morning. You're the senior program manager at the Robin Melanie Walton Sustainability Teachers Academy here at ASU. And just as a quick reminder, the Teachers Academy offers professional development opportunities for in-service K through 12 teachers um, from all subject areas. And they are focused on sustainability science and practice of that. And you are using all your skills in sustainability education, project management, facilitation, and relationship building to take the Teachers Academy and everyone involved with it beyond the traditional adult education, continuous education training, and building a community of practice that is really leveraged through engagement and project developments. And great numbers of teachers have gone through your program, more than 2,500. That is really wonderful to hear. Moving on in our panel, I welcome Kelman Manis. He's the Senior Director for Rural Engagement at the Arizona Science Center, and also Project Manager for the Rural Activation and Innovation Network, which is a National Science Foundation project. Also, you are managing the Arizona Hubs Advancing Computer Science, and you are a collaborator with NASA in the science activation, broadening participation with learning ecosystems. You're a board member of the Food Bank of Tombstone, 
Tombstone. And you also serve on the Cochais Partnership of Council of First Things First. We want to hear what First Things First are. And on the board of the White Mountain Nature Center. And so your bio really makes clear that you focus really on um, rural development and the bridging rural and urban development. And you do this since over two decades. Um, and we're also engaged in STEM learning experiences in order to support positive economic impacts in rural Arizona. Thank you so much for all you do. Speaking on economic development, that is good that you sit next, next to each other. So please welcome Huda Khalife. So Huda is the co-director of Thrive Consultancy, a benefit um, corporation dedicated to building out more sustainable businesses and more sustainable economy in Arizona. And we are looking forward to hear what a benefit corporation is. You received your Master's of Sustainability Solutions and the Bachelor of Arts in Sustainability and Psychology here from ASU. And you have been working on collaborative projects with communities, both globally and locally, to build social and economic resilience, well being, food sovereignty through sustainability principles and practices. And as you see on Huda's slides, which we go deeper in a minute. Huda is really passionate about cooperative business as a tool for communities to build back better. And then last but not least, we already heard from another team member from the city of Tempe. Please welcome Evelyn Broomfield, who is the city of Tempe's first youth climate action coordinator. Um, and you do this work out of the Office of Sustainability and Resilience. And you bring a phenomenal background to this work. Your background is in sustainability education in schools around the Phoenix area. And you also hold a master's in sustainability leadership from ASU. And I know from working with you that you're really passionate about zero waste hierarchy, roller derby, and do, do it yourself culture. And we are so thrilled that you are, um, were able to make time to be here today on this panel and to welcome us here at the RCE. So you see, we have really on our panel, all sectors represented the business, the business community, the municipalities, civil society through to youth advocates, the nonprofit sector, and then the K through 12 higher education sector. Quickly, how can you all participate? We invite you to um, take a picture of this QR code. That's the easiest way. And whenever you have a question or a comment that comes to your mind, you can just um, submit it through um, the link that pops up there. And then Jordan King will be collecting all your questions, all your comments, and he will bring them back to the panel um, towards the end so we can delve into it. And you don't need to worry to hold your questions in your mind. You can really enjoy here the panel. So I'd like to start this panel by hearing a little bit the overview of offerings of sustainability education here in, in the Valley. And I know you all do a lot and I invite you whether you could maybe share a story. Storytelling is always an impactful way to start of what does your organization do to advance access to quality sustainability education, especially um, for underrepresented youth. Maybe since I ended with Evelyn, we go now the other way around and we can hear from you. You can take us um, telling us what you do. Thank you so much, Katya. Oh, that is a warm mic. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Evelyn. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I'm so uh, just pleased to be on this panel with some just absolutely fabulous people. Um, I am a newcomer to the municipal space. I've been with my position for about four months. So I can tell you um, what I am starting on and what the roadmap looks roadmap looks like for me in that uh, city of Tempe space going forward. And I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am to be in this space, to have the awesome responsibility of youth climate action. Um, so for us, starting out, we are really looking forward to being connectors for those sustainability education opportunities. So whether it's connecting, you know, our um, urban forester with a school that desperately needs trees because it is far too hot in the summertime to wait in that, um, that ride line or to walk home. Uh, whether it's connecting uh, sustained, like the teacher's academy with teachers who maybe don't know, don't 
uh, know where to go to get those resources to be those experts or linking them to maybe the Science Center or other nonprofits that do maybe informal sustainability education. Um, also, in my specific day-to-day -day life, I am working on making those connections with the schools directly. So I'm really fortunate to start working with a lot of Tempe Union High Schools to see what youth want to do in a sustainable space or in that sustainability space and what resources we can help empower them with. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And maybe you pass it on to Huda. We can hear from you. Hi everyone, I'm Huda. I'm a co-director at Thrive Consultancy. And I'll try to share in a little story a few of the offerings that we have at Thrive. Um, so if you, any of you have visited the Spaces of Opportunity land in Phoenix, um, southwest corner of that land is the Food Forest Cooperative. And the Food Forest Cooperative is made up of five worker owners that engage in regenerative agriculture and that educate their communities on the benefits and uses of medicinal plants and other foods that are grown on their land. And two of the members of the Food Forest Cooperative were some of the first participants in our Sustainable Cooperative Food Business Training Program, which was oriented towards our veteran community. And they made it, from the beginning of the program, they were complete strangers, Brian Paracano and Chanel Evans. And by the end of those 10 weeks, they became part of the Food Forest Cooperative together. Brian was already there um, and Nellie was onboarded onto the team. That was in November of 2021. And just a few months ago, Hannah, um, the founder of Thrive and my co-director, co um, Hannah and I were able to witness them at the Arizona Corporation Commission building, incorporating as the first for-profit worker-owned cooperative in the state of Arizona. And at Thrive, we truly believe in the power of the sustainable economy to uplift our communities. And that is why we offer the Sustainable Cooperative Food Business Training Program. Um, and just for some background, cooperatives are businesses that are owned and controlled by the very people that use their services. They're shown to be 70% more likely to succeed than their traditional counterparts. Um, their workers have higher levels of happiness and job satisfaction, and they're largely comprised of women and people of color. And while I shared a small snippet of the story from one business in Arizona, there's an emerging movement for a more sustainable economy made up of businesses that are environmentally resilient, economically viable, and socially just. And that's the future that we're looking towards at Thrive. Thank you. That sounds amazing, actually. My name is Cal Menes. I'm the director for rural engagement with the Arizona Science Center. I started at Arizona Science Center after leaving, um, I was the high school science department in the White Mountains, which is in Northeastern Arizona. About a decade ago, I realized that my students were pretty amazing, but they may not have running water or electricity in their homes. Uh, and so what they didn't lack was cognitive ability. What they did lack were resources. It ended up becoming a proposal that we sent to the National Science Foundation to study how to engage communities, rural and remote communities, around STEM and how to use that for economic development and workforce development. We were funded, fortunately. And what we ended up doing was creating four regional groupings of cross-sector community members and using their local assets to build identity and, and spread it organically. It was uh, pre ecosystem, you know, the buzzword, ecosystem buzzword, it sort of happened before that. Uh, those programs were all place-based and we supported over a hundred different innovators in these regions. It ended up being a number of different businesses starting and um, 
a very interesting collaboration with libraries. In many of these rural communities, everybody has a library. Not everybody has, well, a library and a post office and a school. Those are the big three, and usually a bar. But that's not where the kids are, where you meet the kids. Uh, we engage these, these areas, develop these networks, and libraries have become one of our best advocates for uh, choice-based learning and also the, the extension of interest that's local. Many of these folks are by nature um, marginalized and from a variety of different ethnicities and backgrounds. So this continues and it moves forward. My hope as I, as I come back and forth to ASU is to be a bridge between schools like this and then the communities that can really use the assets that they don't even know exist. Thank you so much. Oh, my name is Mauricio Juarez Leon. I am one of the uh, founding members for Fridays for Future at Phoenix, Arizona. And one of the um, questions that we always like as you try to uh, figure out within ourselves is how do we get involved in a lot of these spaces and how we try to like increase engagement within all of these spaces as well. So um, with Fridays for Future, we are um, up and coming. We are still starting out, but we um, have attended a lot of opportunities that are presented with um, ASU. And so what we try to do is try to um, talk with people, build partnerships and try to um, get that community to get going within Phoenix, Arizona. And we've done that through panels like this and also by um, presenting at other um, organizations and councils. Uh, I sit on. Yes, thank you for the, uh, Mauricio put it very well. We are just getting started, so preface that, but we are part of this larger global network. So kind of start, how many of you are familiar with Fridays for Future? You've heard this term before. Okay, many of you. I'll do a quick little blurb. So Fridays for Future was started by Greta Thunberg in 2018 after her school strikes in Sweden, saying that youth need to advocate for climate action. So it is a youth-led global organization focused on climate action and climate justice. And there are many smaller versions. There's Fridays for Future USA and there's Fridays for Future's Phoenix now. So bringing it down to the local level and it is less of an organization and more of a network. We are focused on uplifting the work that people are already doing. And I think Mauricio said it in a way of, we really wanna meet people where they're at. Climate change affects everyone. Climate, everyone is necessary for enforcing climate action and climate justice. Not everyone's aware of how to get involved or aware that they have a role to play in that. So that's our main focus of entering this new role of building these partnerships, building these connections, is finding ways to not only uplift what's already happening, but bring people into the mission and that's the framework we're working with. And we're excited to connect with everyone on this panel today, as well as all of you in the audience. Great. Um, let's see. OK. They gave me a lapel mic. Um, so yay. <laughs> um, so the question was about, sorry, can you? Yeah. What <laughs> does your sure. organization do to advance access to quality gotcha. sustainability education, okay. specifically for underrepresented? Great. Okay. So I, I do have a story about this. The Teachers Academy, we've gone through several iterations, and it started out as um, this immersive intro to sustainability workshop. Um, and now we've grown and we have several different programs. Uh, we still have that flagship program, but one of the other ones is a fellowship program. Um, and the ethos behind that is that you know, teachers are experts of their own community and their, of their own classroom. And so we try and provide support, not only for like uh, individualized learning for a topic that they're interested in, um, and also access to experts on those topics. And um, some of the expertise that the Teachers Academy brings is how do you design a creative and engaging professional development opportunity? So at the end of the um, program, these fellows will deliver their own professional development to the um, to their own community, whether that's their school, district, or local community. Um, this past summer, we launched the program, and one of the fellows is this woman 
um, and her name is Precious, and she lives in Alabama. And she was interested in joining our program because in the Teachers Academy, we see a lot of sustainability issues as, as they are, which is intersectional. So we're not just talking about environmental issues, we're talking about economic issues and uh, justice issues. And one of the activities that we had in our intro course was about redlining. And it's a threat like how historically marginalized people um, have continued to be marginalized due to this systemically racist practice. Um, so when Precious came into the fellowship, she was really interested in creating a professional development, not just for the other teachers in her community, but for other people who were interested about redlining and how it affected her own community. Uh, and she lives in Alabama. And she was actually in a school district that was still segregated. And they were, and this was last year, okay? This was not a long time ago. Um, and they were, they had just created a new high school that was going to be the new integrated high school. And so her professional development um, took the opportunity to say, hey, what's the history here? How can we overcome some of these things? And really diving into not only um, realizing the kind of problems that those systems have created, but you know, talking to others and especially people in the community about how to create solutions through this professional development. Um, so that's, that's an example from the Teachers Academy. Thank you. Wonderful. It was so inspiring to hear everyone's stories and the work that you do. And a couple of things that stuck out to me is really this kind of bridging, an effort to bridge and to coordinate, to bring together, recognizing our history so that we can make sound plans and equitable plans for the future, bridging rural and urban divides, bridging sometimes, you know, government-led efforts to business-led efforts to community-led efforts and meeting people where they are in order to go forward together and then anchoring organizations like libraries that are such an important play, um, play such an important role in supporting place-based and choice-based learning. So thank you so much for um, painting that picture for us of what is already available here in, in Arizona. Now, um, moving on maybe to the next question. So one of our goals as the Regional Center of Expertise for Education for Sustainable Development is that we really want to build these pathways to sustainability education, um, cradle to cradle, I guess. That's what we say in sustainability sometimes, really along the whole um, life cycle of an individual because we are, learning is something intrinsic that humans have. And so what are the opportunities to provide sustainability um, educational opportunities? And so maybe in the spirit of um, building pathways and focusing on the resources that we have, the assets, you spoke to this, Cal, maybe you can share another story of your past or current efforts um, with whom actually you are working together so that we know a little bit more who is who and who does what in, in our field. And what do you work on right now? And how did you go about building these partnerships? Because some partnerships are maybe harder to build than others. And so we know that building partnerships is foundational to education because we learn through relationships. And so maybe I can invite again, Evelyn to start because we heard from the efforts that the city of Tempe went on to learn from the Odam community, from the people's community. And really bring that um, wisdom and stewardship into more policy and practice of the city. And then maybe I can invite all the other panelists to also tell us how you connect to um, the various groups that in the morning we heard we would like to send them more. But Evelyn, please take it away. Wonderful, thank you, Katya. Yes, yeah, so um, this is sort of breaking uh, news for us. So uh, in the Sustainability and Resilience Office, we are definitely led by, um, concepts of equity, concepts of uh, making sure that we are reaching those who are going to be the most affected. And then also because of uh, where we are physically, where we are right now, uh, we definitely want to bring in those indigenous voices and those indigenous concepts. And so um, we actually have uh, one of our partnerships is with the Indigenous Design Collaborative, which is actually housed at ASU. Um, we are working with them. There was a grant that came through and we um, really wanted to give them the opportunity to, uh, and this is a, a group of uh, designers and artists, to really have a moment where they could think and um, really elaborate on what indigenous principles 
are when it comes to inter intersecting with the city, when it comes to designing new spaces, when it comes to redesigning. I mean, infrastructure always has to get, you know, redesigned and fixed. And so um, we uh, will be actually hearing from the results of that grant in about two weeks from this HECU group that is doing um, this wonderful work about really putting, um, putting those indigenous designs into the landscape that we already all um, inhabit. You know, we definitely all know that we have uh, our land acknowledgements and this is another step to sort of not just say the words, but actually integrate what those indigenous principles are and how we can fold them into our work in the city and then beyond. And so um, I'm really excited to, to learn from these creatives and this collaborative to see um, really how we can fold in these principles to how we do our work. Um, and I'm always of the opinion that a rising tide lifts all boats, that if we do um, work for sustainable solutions for those that are the most marginalized, it can only help everyone else as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So previously I was able to share a little bit of one of the offerings that we have at Thrive, which is our sustainable cooperative food business training program. Um, and one thing that we noticed as we started off, oh, okay, um, sorry. One of the things that we noticed as we would have more and more cohorts graduating from the program is that once the graduates would come out of the program driven and excited to, be, to go out and make change, there was not, the world that they were going into was not supportive, did not have the full support system for them to do the change-making work that they were looking to do. And so that began our journey at Thrive to start to develop out the sustainable cooperative ecosystem in Arizona. And this was a path, uh, a long and patient path, and currently is continuing of relationship building and of education. Um, along this path, we built partnerships with various organizations across sectors, um, including legal teams across the nation, um, including financial uh, cooperative financing groups such as Shared Capital, um, and including governmental organizations such as the Arizona Corporation Commission, really looking to build and spread the cooperative knowledge in the state. Um, and along this path, we also found success in building relationships and sharing knowledge and resources with other organizations, businesses, and cooperatives, such as the Phoenix Food Co-op, um, Local First Arizona, and the Democracy at Work Institute. And this was really underlined for us, the power of an economy that is based upon cooperation and collaboration. Um, and at Thrive, we really place value and importance on serving our underserved communities. And so these include women, um, BIPOC communities, our immigrant communities, our indigenous communities, and as mentioned earlier, our veteran communities. And because we are a small and growing team at Thrive um, and relatively new team, we were able to, to develop out the services, the tailored services to serve some of these populations. Um, and we're currently in development of tailored services for other segments of the population. So for example, um, as I mentioned, we had our veteran program cohort, um, and soon we are going to be launching our first Spanish speaking program um, for cooperative business training as well. But currently we are still in the relationship building and development phase when it comes to our immigrant communities and um, our indigenous communities. So that's where we're at currently. So I'm gonna continue on the food concept. One of the things we found over the last few years is food insecurity in rural communities. It is a massively underreported problem. And so one of the efforts that, that we have made over the last few years is how do we break down or ideally destroy silos so that people who do have a, an interest and skill sets 
can come together to help solve a community problem. We have found this, uh, this issue rose to the surface down in Cochise County. And over the last few years, we brought together members of nonprofits, uh, farmers, local farmers, and um, generational farmers to come together. And, and all the generational farmers in Cochise County are people of color. Those many of them have are, are of Mexican descent and have been there before there was a wall. And so we brought people to talk to each other. And many of the folks in rural communities are very self-reliant. They don't want to rely on Phoenix or the governments, or they just don't like outsiders, which is one of the reasons why they live where they live. And so they will work together. But there has to be a champion and there has to be somebody who is like us. We see this in a lot of communities. If you, if you aren't us, you're a them, and them don't understand. Um, even though that may not be true, you know, at the bottom line, it is a perception. And it's a fairly universal perception, I suspect. So we are working on food insecurity, bringing a variety of people together. That's one aspect. The other is with indigenous communities, the Science Center has been very fortunate. The state funded a coding program, coding education program for indigenous youth. And the University of Arizona got part of it, an Arizona State, or I'm sorry, um, the Science Center got a part of that. So we are reaching out with the idea that the skill set of coding provides um, a tool that anybody can use from anywhere. And as the access to the internet becomes more universal, even in areas like in the center of the Navajo Nation, we have Starlink and in Peach Springs, these are places where the children don't have to leave. They can have a business that stays local where their culture can remain and language can continue. Language loss has been a major issue all across the country, but um, we are hoping to, to provide these skill sets and then what is done with them will be locally decided. So one of the uh, committees I've been a part of is the Justice, Equity, and Diversity and Inclusion Committees. And some of the things that um, upon entering that committee I've noticed is how deep-rooted these issues actually are within sustainability and its students and faculty. And upon learning that, how can we as students um, make these issues more um, better for the students there? Also, how faculty are um, affected by these issues as well. So um, just upon working with um, the JEDI a committee, I've learned a lot, a lot about these issues and how um, going into Fridays for Future, um, how we can um, apply these um, tactics and how we can um, lessen the impact these issues have upon the youth and a lot of these organizations uh, as well. And through the partnerships that uh, we build from um, the AC community and outside um, communities, definitely will help out with um, lessening this issue, these issues that may um, impact us in the future. Yeah, to top off of that, um, when it comes to Fridays for Futures, the main thing that we wanna do is build those partnerships, build that network. And a tactic that we use at the Sustainability Alliance is being very hands-on. Um, one of the things with our entire group that we work with here at ASU is you have to be involved with something else. You are part of this alliance, you're focused on this mission of sustainability, but you're bringing another group, another perspective to the table. And we're applying that same lens with Fridays for Futures of ensuring that we have members from the community, from different organizations, from different groups, also not just working in climate and sustainability represented there. And when we're building these partnerships, we're going to them and not saying, hi, we exist, come to us. Um, and the same comes with reaching out to minority communities, indigenous communities, and making sure that we are going to them, we are letting them know that we are here to support them, to follow them, not just to provide a seat at the table for Phoenix Climate Action, but to follow their lead, because this is 
their space to lead in. So those are the priorities that we're really addressing and in going into Fridays for Futures, making sure we're uplifting, we're building partnerships in a hands-on capacity, and we're really just respecting the deep history of Arizona and finding ways to support the mission to reduce systemic issues and bring a lot of the values that Mauricio mentioned, he's learning in Jedi and a lot of students in sustainability and youth around the world are learning now. Uh, one of the cool things that I've noticed just listening to y'all is this, uh, everybody talks about learning, learning and listening from other people. And uh, it's funny because I was going to talk about one of our um, other programs, which is called the Sustainability Learning Labs. And our whole premise is that we are all still learning together. We're always learning from each other. Um, and this model came about based on a relationship that I started in Philadelphia. Um, and it happened years ago. So like five years ago, they had this small grant and I came out and did like one presentation as part of this climate justice summit for the Philadelphia Public School District. And for those of you that know me, I love people and I just love hanging out with people and talking to people. It's one of my favorite things. Um, and so I, I guess I came with that same attitude and I love them, <laughs> shockingly. And so we continue to work together. And so we continue to do a, a climate justice summit every summer for the past five years. And that started kind of leading into other uh, partnership opportunities. And so now I'm sitting on the Philadelphia Public School um, committee for incorporating education for sustainability into their curriculum and into their programming. Um, they have adopted some of the Teachers Academy's guiding principles as some of their guiding principles because they think they're cool. <laughs> uh, and we vibe, right? Like we have a lot of really similar interests, which is why I think the partnership worked really well. And on top of that, we've been able to find more funding so that it's not just a summer initiative, but now we have a um, multiple workshops throughout the year as part of the actual professional development opportunities for the Philadelphia Public School District. And I think that something else that y'all have said is that these kinds of relationships are really organic. And I think that for the Teachers Academy, we have a, it's not a real policy, but like we go where we're wanted. We're not going to force our way into something. And I think that that leads to some of the like biggest, most beautiful partnerships um, that, that we've had. And I'd love to do something like that with y'all here. So do you want to learn together? <laughs> I also clearly picked up on the notion of unlearning and learning. And some of this unlearning is very deep and we need to dig deep because it's so deeply rooted and it takes time. And that's why it goes better in collaboration and cooperation. And then I also realized that from your stories, you were all well connected and then there was this moment where you were so successful in achieving a grant or some source of additional funding that then allowed some catalytic initiative. And um, it seemed you all produce individual change agents and then Huda brought this up very clearly, but it came out in all stories. An individual alone has limited opportunities. And so everyone has built out their respective ecosystems of supporters and support structures. Um, and so that is something we, I definitely take away for us as, you know, as we build this RCE to be mindful of this. Um, and that in this support network, everyone has their role to play on different levels and at different scales. So, so inspiring to hear your stories. And we have only one last round and you can, you know, take it in whatever order you want, because then we open it up to our audience. And um, please remember to... Sorry, I, as we go through the last round, I put the QR code for you one more time here. And then while you're um, checking that, my question to the panelists, could you maybe just in like one sentence share like an outlook to the future? So if you think about the future and you think about Greater Phoenix region, what would access to sustainability education look like if you could create it with the partners that you all work together? I'm going to start it. Stay okay. with your leadership role. That's uh, good. You know me. Um, no, I, when I saw this question, I went really aspirational and I just said like massive, like connections at every level, whether it is sustainability education uh, with, you know, your kid at the library 
or your teacher who's gone through the Sustainability Academy or at the Science Center or as the business owners, just massive aspirational connections just at every level so that people, so that we can meet people where they are, right? So that it is just, no matter who you are, you know where you can go to get that sustainability education and sustainability guidance. So at Thrive, we really envision a future where Arizona and hopefully pushing battery boundaries after that um, has a thriving, sustainable economy, including all of the elements that are necessary for a supportive, sustainable business ecosystem. And so this is an economy that is built on collaboration, on cooperation, mutual aid, um, that builds community wealth. And we're in businesses um, provide education, but also businesses success equates to community and societal success as well. And one thing I wanna add um, to my previous, the previous question, Katya, and as you were speaking at the end, mentioning um, the support systems that allow us to be where we are today, I want to just add to that and highlight Dr. Arnim Week and the Sustainable Food Economy Lab, as well as Joe Russell from the city of Phoenix, um, who sponsored and who both really paved the way and allowed us to have these visions and be where we are today. I don't know that I can add much to those two, but ideally what we see for sustainability is that the concept and the words um, are, are not incendiary. So they switch perspectives of the, that sustainability becomes something that we do, that it's something that's e that, that we see as value and not something to push back against. Because I do see some of that, that we have to be careful of the words we use and the intentions behind them. So that's ideally very soon that's smoothed out and along the horizontal of the whole community, everybody is accepting. Um, making connections at every level is what I was also thinking of. So I would agree 100% with Evelyn that partnership building is really important going into the future, especially um, talking about um, Writers for Future. So I agree, but I'll raise you all. Um, getting a little more ambitious here. I think ideally, Sustainability education won't be a thing in the sense that our educational systems will be inherently socio-ecologically focused and be focused on whatever you're learning. It's focused on how, I keep saying focus, but we're, we're, we're inherently going to be understanding our relationships with nature, with each other and supporting justice and supporting equity. And it's not going to be some extra subject that you can just add on to what you're learning. It's part of the human identity of what you're learning growing up and as you go forward. So a little ambitious, but maybe one day. No, I think that's on point. I was gonna say something really similar actually, because I think that it's, uh, it's redefining our relationships with the world around us and with each other, regardless of the, uh, what it was called. Because I think that there are a lot of people who may um, see sustainability as incendiary, but are actually very good sustainability practitioners. <laughs> um, so that's my vision. And also like, for example, uh, Huna, right? That's your name. Um, your work is so fascinating and I wasn't aware of something like this. So in a very, maybe like less grand vision, this is attainable is what I'm saying. It's like, I would love for students from uh, like very young ages to know that that's an option and that entrepreneurship and these cooperatives is a viable career path. Uh, and not only that, but like, that they can bring their whole selves to it and they don't have to fit into a mold because that's the goal of sustainability that we all thrive. <laughs> yeah, maybe just the last talk from my side on this note of finding the right wording. I love the word um, employee owned cooperatives because it allows us to avoid incendiary words like where people associate cooperatives with socialism. Employee owned um, cooperatives are places where we really democratize access and we democratize agency and ownership. It's not just a rhetorical ownership or ownership in participating in a 
organization. No, it's actually ownership of the shared resources, the common good resources that we have. And so that was very inspirational for me. Thank you so much. Well, we open it up to the questions from the audience. We are all curious what you all shared um, through Mentimeter. And Jordan has been collecting comments and questions. And you are, um, Jordan takes over the moderation for all of you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, please continue to submit your questions. Uh, but we have a couple that have already come in. So first question for the panel. How do you help people and youth understand the importance and impacts of climate change, particularly when their very basic needs aren't being met? So I can speak to that a little bit. Um, they, they know, they know. They know that climate change is here. Um, one thing that I um, didn't quite understand until I started this job, because my previous job didn't have such a deep relationship with my students, it was more of a special guest speaker relationship, is um, youth, of today, not only are aware, but they've got climate anxiety. Because if you think about it from, you know, a 13, 15, 18, 20 year old, they are feeling the effects that they had absolutely no hand in producing. There's some data to suggest that, you know, gr the grandparents or great grandparents emitted far more carbon than the, the youth of today ever will. So um, when we get down to the science and the nitty gritty of like how things work, it tends to be a little bit more hands-on. And um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that science is fun and so are labs. And so when you learn about what albedo is or um, how the water cycle works when there's increased temperature over the oceans and why maybe hurricanes might be more powerful, that stuff makes sense. But youth know, they definitely know. Yeah. Oh, can I go ahead? Um, I think one of the powerful things about a sustainable economy is that everyone, like the basic needs that are talked about, everyone needs a livelihood at the most basic level. Um, but what's really cool about sustainable business models and sustainable thriving economies are that you don't need, there is an established way and there are multiple examples thriving all across the nation and across the world that demonstrate that you don't need to sacrifice um, economic viability or livelihood or basic needs in order to also value and uplift people and planet forward values in a business. Well, out in the ranching families, people are seeing the impact immediately. So cattle can now graze in the wintertime up in the north. Um, and there are different pests that are affecting the cotton. So kids see this immediately because it affects their family and their economics. And I, there's, a, there's a bit of insecurity as to what they can do about it. I think that's our, that's our gap. How do we provide resources that are easily consumable and place-based. Um, I, I can speak a little bit to that. I would say, you know, along Evelyn's point, they know. Like youth, I think, are a lot more, well, let me take a step back. When we're looking at issues around climate change, it's important, especially from like the Teachers Academy and I think from all of our perspectives to understand the intersectionality between climate change and the fact that people's basic needs are not met because these are one in the same types of systems. And so I think that um, youth and young people know a lot more and I think they have a lot more of an intersectional perspective than, than I had when I was younger. And so I think that addressing both of these issues is part and parcel to, to leading to that, to that answer. I see Darice's hand up. Darice. Can I quickly yeah. Uh, yeah, get her a mic. <laughs> Yay. Hey. Hi, everyone. I'm Doris Ellis from the city of Phoenix, and I asked that question. Um, and it has a lot to do with some of my experiences. I lived in Philadelphia, and I just don't agree with what you're saying and to your answers. There are some children, and depending on the neighborhoods, and maybe we've just been fortunate out here, that we, if you've looked a kid in the face who does not have food, and they really don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And they are seven years old. 
and they are the, the breadwinner for that family, how do you talk to them about climate change? And that maybe I didn't explain my question clearly, mm -hmm. but there is a message. It's no different than telling some of our folks out here that don't agree with sustainability. Then I ask them, well, do you want clean air? Do you want safe water? So it's developing that message. And that's what I'm asking you guys that are working in communities and you're talking about the type of people that you're trying to reach. Have you looked a person in the face that has no food and tried to explain climate change to them? I would say that I wouldn't try to explain climate change. <laughs> I think that those things come later. And I, I like when I say that these issues are part and parcel to each other, right? We're looking at a whole system of inequities that has also led to climate change. And so for me, when I look at somebody or am interacting with somebody who maybe hasn't had their needs met, I'm not concerned about them fighting climate change because quite frankly, they're not causing climate change. <laughs> um, and so I think that you bring up a really good point when we talk about intersectionality that like, these are, there are needs that are very pressing. I don't really know where to go from there, but I think that, I think that everything is so interrelated that I wouldn't talk to somebody about climate change because it's not relevant to them in that point in their life. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I will tap into this because I love your question. I think it's incredibly important um, just because I don't, I think every youth have heard of climate change, but whether or not they care, whether or not they really know what it means, whether or not it's a passing word, that is a completely different story because climate education isn't incredibly accessible. And it's, you are not going to look someone in the face and say, you can't get your basic needs met but we want you to solve the climate crisis. You're not going to do that, but they're just as much involved in having a voice in the climate crisis. Um, like if you, if you can't meet, if you're living day to day, you're going to have a hard time thinking about future generations because you need to focus on the now. You need to think about your generation, your family, but that's where the beauty of sustainability education, especially in the formal and informal comes in of making sure that is accessible because the other barriers is not knowing about opportunities. Um, I come from a very different background in terms of knowing the story personally, but grew up in urban and rural areas of Ohio. So from working with youth in those areas, growing up, interacting um, with people from very different backgrounds and seeing what they went through and also um, having a mother who's a school teacher in those schools and seeing their education versus my education and what they were provided, they were very, very different. And you can't expect someone that doesn't have access to the initial resources that other people do to know the opportunities that exist for them to pursue activism, um, to pursue working with climate, to know that what they can do in their community, how their actions apply, how even if you're working day to day trying to survive, what steps you can take to get more involved, to get on this pathway, and ultimately to be one of the leading voices in this area because my biggest pet peeve I will just put out there right now is I do not feel like I'm the voice to talk about climate change, but it's very hard to find opportunities for other voices to have the resources necessary to be able to make financial sacrifices to be able to do unpaid leadership roles in climate and sustainability. And that is one of the biggest barriers that needs to be focused on. And education can provide that as well as finances and as well as just being aware of this and trying to uplift the voices of people that are living day to day and need to be at the forefront of advocating for the climate crisis. So I have one thing to say about um, marginalized communities. Most of my students, I'll just give you a short view of my students over the, the last couple of decades. Most of them felt that their voice was not heard, that no matter what they said, they had no power, they had no in anything. And they, you know, they, they had no power about where they lived or the circumstances. When you give students it, one small thing that they do have power over. So 
something simple, like how do you dispose of plastic? It's um, incremental steps to empower people. Can't expect youth to go from where they are and the circumstances they live and solve these massive global problems, but they can solve one or two issues that they can touch. They can solve water issues or plastic, something that they have, something that's tangible to them. And now they're empowered. And maybe I can just add a closing thought that this round of questions, because I know Jordan has two more. Um, I take your comment and this wonderful inspirational discussion here also to us at the center, because it reminded me to think about who actually needs to be educated about climate change. And what do we need to be educated about? And remembering what Braden Kay said in his morning plea made me think it's more us adults and we are educated about climate change, but are we educated as much about the problem of a changing climate as well as the solutions and to whom we can offer which kind of solution for participation? And can we take the responsibility of what we can do in this space and connect the intersectionality to explain why somebody's food insecure with regards to climate change and what our actions are. So I think your question, Doris, is really important for us to think maybe it's not this person who needs to be educated about climate change, but we as adults need to be educated about the lack of effective action that continue to lead, leave certain problems to be persistent. And so thanks so much for that inspiration. And back to you, Jordan. Great. Uh, perhaps as a conclusion, we can do a, a lightning round to this final question, uh, which is, as you, we navigate emotions such as ecological grief, climate anxiety, and the other challenges you all face, perhaps in a, a few words, could you describe what gives you hope in the work that you do? I can go over. So um, something that uh, gives me hope a lot within um that a question is definitely seeing others involved and seeing how others are also passionate about um building all of these um coalitions and communities so um that definitely helps me like lessen my anxiety and my um pressure to do like a lot of these things in the future so definitely like seeing a lot of these movements that are youth-led going on as well that i'm not alone um in the fight for climate yeah, just to echo what Mauricio said, um, seeing all of you in the room, hearing about all the great work that we've done just for the people on the panel here, um, less news, more connection. So the biggest hope is seeing the variety of sectors that are actually making an effort around climate change and sustainability and they want to make change i think this is a really great question because um sometimes it is hard to to maintain hope in these kind of situations um i use a lot of dark humor which is maybe not appropriate <laughs> um but i would also say that uh Self-care is a really important piece of working in the sustainability field. Um, and for me, I one of the reasons I do this work is because I'm extremely connected to the land and inspired by nature. And so I continue to get outside and be inspired by the things that I care about. And also, yeah, more connection. I think that one thing that keeps me inspired is knowing that we don't have to wait for um, the structures around us to some extent to bring us the change that we want to see, but that we have to some extent, of course, we do need the support, but we have the keys to actually engage in things that will build the community wealth, will build our own communities up and uplift our communities. And there's examples time and again across the world, across the nation that have shown that these impacts are actually being created with these community wealth building tools. 
Okay. I'll, I'll say hope is hard to find in this field. Um, it is, it can be incredibly lonely. It can be incredibly slow, but I think there is hope in the sense that ultimately once most people want to do good, they just need the tools to be able to do it. And I, as we're slowly learning more and people are getting more involved in these movements, there is hope that it will grow. It needs a little more urgency, but there is hope that as we as individuals who are already passionate about this, pass it on to more people and build these connections into the realms that we're not necessarily focused on sustainability yet, it builds potential for this just catalyst to go on and on. So there's hope in ourselves and there's hope in the people we connect with and there's hope in just pushing this forward with a little urgency. So everyone talked to like five people today about climate change. And it sounds like that through all the work you do in collaborating and building these synergies and creating community wealth in different ways, we also move away from extractive approaches and exploitative approaches to often are an acceleration of despair. And so that collective effort is hope building as well. That's what I heard from all of you. Well, please join me in just thanking this wonderful panel for the amazing thoughts, the amazing work you do and for sharing this all, bring it out in the open so that we can participate and support it. Thank you so much, everyone. And just a quick heads up of what's coming up this afternoon. So we have a 2.45, another wonderful panel. Um, up in the Bridges room. I think. Let me quickly flip. Oops. Panel two, what are the human sciences? This is on which floor, Alejandro? In here. It's also in here. And then you can just stay. And then there's the third panel organized by Lizzie and colleagues. Um, bringing art and um, policymakers together around climate futures. And then we will have a nice gathering outside with some refreshments so that we can talk about everything we've heard and learned and come out with a reignited hope, hopefully from the day. Thank you so much for joining us for the panel. We really appreciate your participation and your support. And thank you panelists one more time. <laughs> <laughs>